It's the Stephen Rowan Show. It's Stephen Rowan. Stephen Rowan. Stephen Rowan. Stephen Rowan. Bringing you entertaining and inspiring guests. Okay, welcome to another edition of the Stephen Rowan Show. Today's guest is Andrew Dobie from Made Brave. Made Brave is the name of one of the UK's most dynamic digital creative agencies. It's also a great description of the founder, Andrew Dobie. Why Made Brave? Well, quite an undertaking. In 2012, he set up the agency with a two-week-year-old baby and a thousand pounds in cash. A freelancer, if you like, a gun for hire. And now he has offices in Glasgow and London, awards galore, including Agency Employer of the Year. 31 plus staff. He also sits on the boards of numerous companies. He is an industry authority, a motivational speaker, and has an international client list that would make the most seasoned agency gasp. His clients include TEDx, Van Gogh, SFN Expo, Lynn, Kiltwalk, Flavourly, Bowmore, Agrego, to name but a few. The company grew by 15% in 2016 and turned over in excess of 1.1 million. So join us for a chat as we discuss business, entrepreneurship, humour and the benefits of having an indomitable spirit. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the show Mr Andrew Dobie. Thank you for your time today, I know you're a busy man. No problem at all, hey, well, glad to be here. So when did you start on visuals? Was it drawing or photography that first drew you in? Um, so as a, as a child, um, I, I drew a lot. My mum was really encouraging in that sense. And uh, so I think from as, as far back as I remember, five, six years old, um, I was constantly doing drawing competitions. And um, I think um, my mum just kept encouraging it and I was constantly winning these things. And that's probably where my creative spark started, if you like. And was your mum keen to give you like lessons or demonstrate or was it like more encouragement? I think she maybe just saw there was something there. Um, I mean, it's quite funny now because I'm not really that good at drawing now, but I think as a child I was a better drawer. So, um, But that's kind of developed me more into photography and visual communication, if you like, I suppose. So. And when did you get your first camera? My first camera, that's a good question. Um, I think maybe around 12 or 13 I got my first camera and my mum had got me it just as a surprise. It wasn't something I'd asked for, but um, yeah, I think that was the one thing that sort of um, kick-started me into the whole photography world. And were you immediately into like, the mechanics of settings and exposures and timings? Were you just like, let's go and shoot some stuff? Yeah, no, I think when you're a kid you just start snapping anything really, you know. Uh, but, you know, I, I think it, it, I kind of self-taught myself exposure, and, and but I, that probably only came sort of leading into when I started at university or college and started to learn, you know, maybe hear a little bit about exposure and then so developed my learning from there, so. And what was your first business? My first business? So, well I suppose Made Brave is the first actual business. I was a sole trader just before I set up Made Brave, so I first of all left and um, started as a freelance designer and in my first year um, I didn't really know that, you know, I, I, I didn't set out to create an agency, so I, I just set out to to, to earn some more money, really, it was money, it was money driven, really. And um, when my wee boy Finley, when, when he was in the in the womb, um, I set up a business called Baby Gaga. So I did like baby photography, um, and I had this kind of idea. I'd seen this kind of niche market of baby photography in America, where they kind of bundle them up in little bundles and um, with a really shallow depth of field photography, and, it's, and no one was doing it here. So I thought I'll do that and. Did quite a number of babies, and I realised you can only do two of them in a day, and they're very messy and very noisy. Um, and I also did seven seven weddings at the same time, and all while freelancing design, etc. But then the, the design bit, thankfully, sort of did take off, so I concentrated on that. So you were doing weddings, you were taking photos of babies, and you were also doing your own design stuff I as well. Sort of, yeah, um, yeah, corporate sort of design work. Yeah. And was that a conscious idea to? You know, a three pronged attack, or was that just what caught your fancy at the time? No, I was just, you know, I think I was just like sort of grasping at everything I knew, and then I was kind of seeing what rose to the top, if you like. And so, the motivation becoming for a freelance designer was that that you wanted to strike out on your own? Was it you wanted to express yourself more creatively, or was it just like it's time? Yeah, no, it was, uh, you know, as, as I mentioned, just it was really money driven. I'm not a hugely money driven person, although I like the nice things in life and I, you know, I want to be able to support my family, but it was, it was driven by that. I, was in, I, was, I worked in a small agency for eight years straight out, of, like, straight out of uni and I'd never really looked up. I just sat and learned my craft and I was very naive about the business world, didn't know much about it, but 
um, I knew my wife was going to not be working and I wasn't on enough money and the company, you know, um, not for any badness of them, they just they couldn't afford to pay me anymore as such, so I had to take um, things into my own hands and so I left literally, yeah, just because I thought I, can earn, I think I can earn a bit more um, doing it for myself. And how did you feel about striking out in your own? Looking back now, it all seems a bit of a blur, really. <laughs> um, you know, I think at the time there was a lot of people that was were saying to me, "No, what, what are you doing? You've 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 got this young baby at home. You can't you can't be thinking about that. You need security. You need um, a salary that, that that's going to be there every month." But I'm kind of a doer person, so I thought, you know, even if the design thing doesn't work, I'll I'll go and take photos. I'll go and I'll cut grass. I'll do whatever it takes. And you know, and very quickly I realised that. Um, there wasn't going to be any issues, you know, because I think we're, th someone told me that there's always work for the good guys, the, the guys that are willing to, to find it, So, and I've found that since day one. And was it, was it quite an exciting period? Um, nervous? Nervous, I think, yeah. At first, you know, you don't, you know, I, I, I didn't literally know anything about kind of, um, well, I, I mean, I say I didn't know anything, I, I knew a reasonable amount. I'd had kind of experience in, my, in the smaller agency. I was pitching to clients, I was doing work, I was managing um, you know, other creative staff, if you like. So I wasn't new to a lot of that stuff, but it was more, I think, fending for yourself and, you know, knowing how to deal with accountants and tax and all these things. And I think when you start earning money when you're, you know, a sole trader, that a lot of that, that that's, that's probably the first hurdle for a lot of people, that the, the, the fear of, you know, what, what money do I need to keep by, how much is earning a lot or how much is not. And, um, yeah, so I think... but. And I think for me, it was the, the difficult challenge of I, I was doing that and I was working long days and then I was going home and I had a baby, so um, so I wasn't really sleeping either. So, But I had to, you know, I, my wife was really supportive and she knew the bigger picture, so um, that helped a lot. So the biggest challenge was just the time management and trying to yeah. wrap everything into the 124 hour period? Yeah, and I think that, I think that goes for starting up any business, you know, if it's a, especially if it's a, a service-based business, you ha you're having to service clients, so, you know, while you're servicing and doing clients, you're also trying to set up everything else behind that and plan for the future and, you know, and find new business, so that, that can be pretty challenging and, you know, the only variable that can really change there is usually time because, you know, the only time you get to do the work is going to be in the evening because during the day you were trying to find clients and... Like, but I think as well that the time management within any creative industry, there's an idea of what the client wants, or yeah. there's a client brief, but then quite often I've found, and this is you know me being a customer, is that I get this idea back and you know the designer says, what do you think of that? And I'm like, great, but could be or can we? And there's always a, a, you know, a couple of changes. And ultimately you want the client to be as happy as you can. Yeah. So I always think time management in anything creative yeah. is really hard because it's, you know, yeah. expectations grow is you give them an amazing product and then just go, can we just, what about that colour? Yeah. I think it's just human nature of, you know, the curiosity when somebody sees a piece of, of design that they just want to expand it. Yeah, exactly. And I think, you know, any, any creative, you know, entrepreneurs that I've seen or witnessed that, that either have a challenge or, you know, that, that hasn't worked out for them, it's usually because they almost care too much about the creativity and they're not thinking about it as a business and time management. So... From the, from the day one, really, I've made brave. I was very aware that, you know, as well as doing great creative, this has to work as a business, um, because it, otherwise it's not going to support me, it's not going to support the employees. And, you know, being a leader here, it's my responsibility to make sure that, you know, these guys are going to get paid and their families get fed, etc. So, you know, for some people it can feel like, oh, that, that's taken away from the creativity, but I think it's equally as important as the creativity. So, So here, you know, we are very focused on, you know, making sure that brief is tight at the beginning and making sure we, you know, we have the expectation of the client and um, time management here is something that we take, you know, really seriously and make sure that we've got um, the right systems in place to kind of make sure, um, you know, time's not going to bleed away because if it bleeds away in one project, it bleeds into the next and yeah. the next and then suddenly you don't have a business. I think as well sometimes working within a constraint yeah. It forces the brain either to work quicker or sharper or faster, or sometimes even in a completely different way. Yeah, no, it's definitely, I'm a, I hugely agree on that. You know, if you give a designer or a creative, and I know because I am one, and if you, if you give me a year to do something, I will take a year to do it. If, if you give me two days, I will do it in two days, and I'll probably do it better than I was going to do yeah. in a year. So, I think there's something about the rhythm of thought as well. Yeah. You know, if you're going either, you know, coming back to it, or if you're just taking too long, 
And I, I personally think that I can miss a bit of a rhythm of thought. Whereas when it's like 45 minutes, you've got to get this done. I don't know if it's adrenaline, but you just like, you know, snapping away and it just becomes a more fluid piece. Yeah, no, definitely, definitely. I think um, I was reading a book recently, um, Sprints um, by Google, I think, and they talk about this, they have this kind of five day sprint where um, they found that, um, you know, rather than again running for weeks up on weeks on, on lots of problems, throughout Google, um, they run these sprints and they're five days and they get key people in the room and they have five days and, and what they do is they put a hard deadline at, on the fifth day. So like either you know, you're gonna have to present this to customers or a focus group, so there's something that cannot shift. And they say that it's kind of proven that it forces the problems to be solved and it forces them to be done better than, than if you just let them hang for much longer. That sounds great. What's the name of the book? Sprints. Um, I I have it next door. <laughs> oh, oh. I think it's, a, it's um, if, if you search for Google Sprints, it's a kind of methodology that they use right throughout the business. Um, they say it's not it's not based on Agile, but it complements Agile methodologies. So um, a really interesting read. There's audio books available and Audible as well. So, so what what's the one piece of advice you would give to somebody if they are thinking about striking out in their own at the very beginning? I think you know. Um, I think there's a culture these days of you know everyone's almost an entrepreneur, and you know. Um, I, I get called that these days, but I, I, you know, I, can, I can't even spell the word. And, um, I, no one can. No, I know. <laughs> thanks for Google. Um, but I, th I think you've got to, you know, people often look at Made Brave and say, wow, look what Andrew's done or the team have done in the last um, you know, four or five years. But what people often miss in the story is that, you know, 10 years previous to that, I mean, I'm 35 now, so if you imagine Made Brave was 30 when I was starting it, but for the last 10 years previous to that, I'd been self-teaching me photography. Um, I'd been, you know, every month with my salary, I was taking a little bit of money and building up my gear. Um, I'd been a salesman in car from warehouse, so I'd learned how to sell and talk to people. Um, and, and, and all of these things started to come together by the time I was 30. So, you know, you, you've got to be prepping for a business long before you think um, for it to succeed. And so, you know, um, I, yeah, I think, I think, I don't, I don't know what my point was there, but essentially, but I think, you know, what I'm trying to say to people like starting a business is that it's never too early to start thinking about and planning for it. So, so amalgamate the skills, amalgamate yeah. the experience, know where you're going, almost like a five-year plan. Yeah, exactly. You've got to be thinking much further into the future from, from very much from when you're younger. I was talking at um, Glasgow, um, City of Glasgow College to the photography students and they were asking sort of what's the biggest tip you can give and... I was, I was kind of mentioning to them that, you know, the people that they're in the class with are going to become their, their clients or their colleagues or employees later on. So relationships you build really early on in life, you know, they, they, there's a sort of natural point often where they all come to the surface and all the skills that you've been working on all come together as well. So I think in business people talk about, you know, an opportunity or an opening. And I think the idea is that, well, that's great, but nobody looks before that and says, well, for five years, the guy was doing this, so he's great at that. For yeah. 10 years, he had a relationship with that guy. And it's almost like if there's an opportunity and you have all the skills to walk through that door, then yes, it's great. But I think sometimes people go, you know, oh, yeah, it was great. You know, I just walked into it. But as you say, the reality yeah. is you just start getting these skills. Exactly. And I think, you know, communication, uh, and this is no diss to anyone that's creative or anyone mm -hmm. that's purely into business. I think sometimes people can become incredibly craft orientated yep. or business orientated. And I think the wonderful thing about Made Brave is that you guys can go in, you can communicate an idea incredibly well, not mm -hmm. only to the, the end client or to the man in the street that's walking past the product, but also going in there and listening, which is yeah. the, the number one thing. Yeah, and I think you know you have to create opportunity in life. You know, a lot of people feel that oh, the opportunity never comes to me, it never happens, but you have to put yourself in situations. I mean, I'm constantly putting myself in my comfort zone, um, you know, and I, I feel that a lot of startups and, you know, perhaps why they fail is that, you know, they fail to tell people what they need and what they're trying to do and what they offer. So, you know, from the early days of Made Brave, I made sure I was anyone that would listen to me. <laughs> I was telling them what I was doing. I was telling them what I wanted to be and slowly but surely it starts to happen. Um, and then I'm a big believer in, if there's any opportunity for traveling anywhere, you know, I get asked to, you know, go and, I was on a tech mission to Germany recently, and, you know, they said, would you want to come along? And, you know, of course I want to come along, because you just never know who you're going to meet and how that's going to change your thinking, and then what opportunity that's going to bring. But really, it's not opportunity, because you've, you've, you've set it up, um, so. 
But it's true what you're saying when you start off in business. You need to be, you know, I don't want to say made brave, but you need to be courageous, you need to be bold, you need to, you know, just grab someone's ear and say, this is what I'm doing, either, you know, what do you think of it or this is what I'm doing, can you help me? But, you, you know, you really do need to wear your heart on your sleeve. Yeah, and I, and I think you, you, you have to make sure and find, like, you know, I, I, I'm a big fan of Simon Sinek and, um, you know, if you've not listened to his talks, you know, he's got a great talk which is called Start, Starts... Um, with starts why. with why, yeah, and you know, there's a TED talk and there's a book, etc. And I think, you know, I find a lot of people um, tend to try and mimic other businesses, and, and you know, that's not always the worst thing because you know, you can you can often mimic something and improve on it. But I think if if solely that's all you're doing is trying to mimic, you know, it's it's you need to almost find your unique you know, selling point. You know, you're your own unique USP. So you know, Made Brave works for me because. You know, I merged the design and photography that was my skill set, so that became my marketing, if you like. But for for anyone starting their business, they've got to find their own why. Like, why why are they doing what? You know, because if they're just if they're trying to live mine, it's, it, it 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 shows through. So, but it is a unique thing when you look at the Made Brave website. You immediately just go on whether it's you know the Iron Man thing or yeah. uh, whether it was the Commonwealth Games. Like you immediately go and you just go, wow. Somebody's really into Photoshop. Yeah, but yeah. somebody with an imagination able to, you know, work a solution, not necessarily from a problem, but just get something you've never really seen before. Yeah, exactly. And you yeah. could you could walk past, you know, ten pieces of print and you could just go, That's made brave, definitely, because they just have that they have yeah. that luxury about them. Yeah, and I think when I, when I was doing that stuff I wasn't even thinking about it. You know, that was just when I was at college or uni or I used to do that stuff for fun. I used to sit up at night photoshopping my Heads face, my friends' faces on someone else or something else, and I just started kind of doing that in here. And I think when you start putting that out, what what it does for us here is it starts to attract other designers and creatives that get it, and um, customers and you know people that want to be involved in the brand that get it. And so it's it's kind of a hook for us that works really well. Yeah, it's like an identity. I mean, I don't want to say it's you know hilarity or frivolity, mm -hmm. but certainly when you see that stuff and then you meet somebody from Made Brave, yeah, it's mirrored. Yeah, exactly. I think if you came in here and it was very different, you know, it shows through. I think if marketing is not actually what people are doing, then yeah, you know, people see through that. So it's it's really important to to do what's what's right for you. So when clients come in here, we we don't try and push that they should be doing that for their brand. We try and figure out what their unique why is, and then sort of build a visual style around that for them. I want to see an accountant with an Iron Man in the front page. Exactly. <laughs> why not? <laughs> so uh, how have you how have you planned your company? Planned it, ah, right, <laughs> that's a question. Um, yeah, in what sense do you mean just kind of for, for so, how we got to this scale? Yeah, so, so where you are now, is this where you thought you would be, like, say, two or five years ago? Yeah, so I think, you know, as I mentioned earlier, I never even set out to create an agency. It just kind of started to happen. It started to snowball, and um, I think, you know, um, the, the vision for the company, I, I had a very, I'm, I'm very visual, as you get, so... But, my vision had always been kind of visual of how I wanted the studio to look and where it wanted to be. And I kind of first hit that first vision when I was in South Block and we had the place looking great, but then suddenly it was crammed and there was too many of us. And so very clearly I had the next vision, which is where we've now managed to get to at the Albus. And so I've kind of always planned that way. I've never been really a planner of, I want to be, you know, 5 million turnover, 10 million turnover in terms of money. I kind of feel that if I have the the vision of how it should look and feel, then the money should follow. Um, but it's, for me, um, yeah, the, the planning of it is kind of, I'm quite opportunistic as a entrepreneur, so I think you get some people that drive for a, a number or a, you know, a, you know, a certain scale, if you like, whereas I'm more, I quite like the fluidity of, you know, I'm in Germany now, something's appeared and that's going to change because of that, so... Um, yeah, I, I, yeah, I'm less kind of a written plan, more a little bit in gut. So just, well, let's get a crack in product and then after that the money will come? Yeah, I think, you know, by I focus very early getting the culture and the brand right because I want the right people here and not only because of, for business, just but I want to surround myself with, you know, driven, you know, creative, entrepreneurial people that like the same things as me. Um, so, yeah, I think... By, by, by concentrating internally and making sure that that's right, that... Um, that I just have a belief that will kind of take us on the right path, whatever that may be. So I've been in here a couple of times, and 
it's a very interesting office. Obviously, it's filled with creators, but everyone seems to get on. There seems to be communication. There's I don't want to go back to hilarity because for some reason hilarity <laughs> sounds bad in business. You should, now shall not have fun in business. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> uh, how do you establish a culture like this where everyone does get on and everyone does communicate? And you know, I'm looking out the window just now, and you know, everyone does have smiles on their face, which is great. That's good. Get back to work. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I think yeah, I I, I don't know. I don't, people ask that question a lot, and. You know, um, we we still working at it. You know, like we, I think it's a, a culture is a thing you've continuously got to work on, and um, you know we've worked hard to develop it and trying to you know do things that are different in the office place. And um, I, th I think the, the the genuine thing is like just trying to find the right people that f you know that fit. Um, you know, we, if you have if you have someone negative in the team or if there's like something poisonous that, you know, I've learned more and more so that you have to kind of squish or, or remove that energy. Um, so I'm a big believer in positivity and optimism and, and doing things. And so I, I really just try and surround people that, that have that kind of um, mentality. And then I almost get out of their way, you know, um, because, you know, all the guys in the different departments in here, they're 10 times better than me at, at every bit of what they do. And I kind of almost worry that if, Made Brave ever fails that I don't know what the hell I will do because uh, because these guys are all better than me and I'm almost you know I'm almost like a conductor now that I'm not doing each of the parts so um, yeah I think to to allow people to do their be their best self and then you get the best out of them and, and they start to create the culture so a lot of it's not created by me people are just doing it themselves and can we talk about the director of fun director of fun yeah Raymond uh -huh. so so tell us a bit more about that so yeah, no Raymond. Um, you know Raymond's just one of these characters that's really like like <laughs> epitomises, I suppose, what we're just discussing of optimism. And he has a great phrase that um, if someone's having a bad day, Raymond always says, "You can start the day any time." And I, I love that because you know, like often people wait to reset the following day. And recently mentioned that to me, and I thought that's great. And you know, Raymond just as like culture wise, he was just one of the ones in the office that. If he saw someone was down naturally, he's going over and, hey, how's it going? And looking after someone and creating fun. And um, so we thought, why not actually just, why don't we give him this title as well and give him some budget? And so Raymond kind of uh, pulls together, like, um, he, he has, you know, he can just decide we're going to, um, I don't know, buy lunch for everyone today. We're going to use it from some of the budget because I think everyone's been working hard and they want to do that. So it's just, it's just, it's almost putting a bit of focus on it, and I think, obviously from a press and PR point of view, it, it gives something to talk about, but it, it allows us to talk about that it's something that we value of actually, you know, why can you not have fun at work? <laughs> it's like, yeah. It's life. It's, but uh, I think morale is so important in the workplace. <coughs> I come from a hairdressing background amongst many others. You have beautiful hair. Thank you very much. <laughs> I, I dried it myself this morning. But one of the one of the big things that attracted me to hairdressing was the fact that I could go in a, in fact this is what I wrote down my application form, wouldn't it be great if you could work in an environment where everyone was having fun, yeah. you could improve the value of someone's day and within a 45 minute period you could turn a frown into a smile. Mm -hmm. uh, and when I managed shops, my main thing was like, okay, let's come in, let's do the work, let's satisfy the client's needs that exceed their expectations. But you know, let's have you know, let's have a dance off if that's what's required in the morning, or let's have high fives, or you know, let's buy breakfast for the whole shop because that's what it, yeah. you know, because that's more important than you know the bottom line. Sometimes are people coming to work because if they're smiling, the clients are smiling. If the clients are smiling, they're spending money. If they're spending money, then they're telling their pals, and it's yeah, you know, exactly. it's it's all good. It's that circle. You also won Employer Agency of the Year. Yeah. Was that was that a big thing for you? Yeah, no, that's a you know, for me, I feel very proud of that, and the team feel very proud of that. It's um, you know, um, I mean, we, you know, when when you set out to create a business, and then um, you know, you're not looking for a pat on the back all the time, but you know, I think it's quite nice sometimes when you get these awards, just to kind of, um, it helps kind of push me forward and give me that wee extra buzz of adrenaline to kind of know that you're doing the right thing. I think it's just when someone from the outside. <laughs> Tells you that it's a it's a nice feeling. It um, obviously helps as well, trying to attract the right people to our team as well. You know, um, and yeah, no, I'm very pleased with that. So, so how do you spend your time? Because you're a designer, you're a PR person. We've discussed, yeah. and you're obviously the the captain of the ship, the leader. So, how do you split your time? 
Yeah, so I'm, I'm off the tools completely now, so um, I don't design or I'm not involved in client projects in that sense. <laughs> who's doing Iron Man? Who's doing all the, <laughs> no. doing all the Well, I do stuff? some of that, to be fair, so that's where I get, you know, I do need, um, I do need to get some creativity out, so... Yeah, I know I'll often do a bit of um, Photoshop for some of the social posts um, just to make me feel alive. And um, you'll often find me tinkering around with camera gear or new equipment in, in the office. Um, but like most of my time now, I suppose, is um, leading the business and, you know, just making sure we're heading in the right direction. So a lot of that involves, you know, I'm a, um, a big believer in kind of sharing your knowledge and giving back. So I'm out, you know, two or three talks every week telling the story of Made Brave and what we've done and how I've, I've, I've done this here um, and kind of giving back to kind of schools and unis. So a lot of the schools and unis asked me to come in and talk to the younger generation, which is, which is what we need in Scotland because there's a skills sh shortage of digital and creative people. You know, often they can head off down to London um, and we need a kind of a pipeline essentially of creativity and tech people to keep the Scottish economy growing in this um, which you know and we have a great um, tech and creative industry here and it's just um, making it's important I think for if you're in a position of power or leadership that you have to kind of help that um, to continue um, for the next generation so so yeah, yeah you know out talking um, kind of, um, yeah, just, uh, you know, walking the floors in here, talking to everyone, seeing what's happening. We're still a young business, so we're still improving processes and, you know, working through all that. So I'm involved heavily in kind of figuring out um, and setting all that up to make sure we've, we've got a strong business, essentially. So how do you turn off from work? Because you're incredibly busy. Yeah. And you're wearing a lot of different hats. So what is it that relaxes you? Um... So I've recently moved out to Eaglesome in the middle of nowhere. So um, and I think I love that. You know, I'm, I'm um, I spent. You know, my, my weekends I don't do any work at all. So Saturday and Sunday is time for my wee boy Finley and my wife Pam. So have you bought wellies and a barber jacket? I have actually. I've not got a barber jacket yet, but I've got the wellies. Yeah. You're gonna get an axe. I've got an axe. I've got multiple axes. So that's something. Uh, sounds a bit serial killer there, doesn't it? But, no, um, no. I just have the chopping wood is my thing. Is well, uh, I think chopping wood is actually incredibly relaxing. It's a great workout. Yeah. And there's a massive sense of fulfillment. You've maybe turned like a massive piece of wood, whether it be into kidling, and then yeah. you can you can arrange it all. But I'm guessing that you, because he's a designer, I'm guessing that you have your axes and they're either like from small to large or from large to small. Am I right or wrong? Uh, well, I'm, I'm kind of one of these guys. I was like, if I'm going to chop wood, I'm going to find the world's best axe. <laughs> so I scoured the web and... Um, Gransfors Brooks, this little Swedish um, brand of hand, hand forged axes, and they've got like a beautiful leather kind of sheath on them. And um, yeah, you're, no, you're, you're making eagles from hipster. <laughs> <laughs> no, exactly. You're making it cool. <laughs> but yeah, no, I think it's important, um, you know, in downtime to actually have downtime. You know, um, you can burn out, and you see a lot of people burning out in business, and there's only one you, so you've got to look after the brain and, you know, and, and your family, essentially. So, you know, I'm. You know, I think in the early days of Made Brave, I was working 12, 2 in the morning, but that never anymore. So, you know, I get home now probably 7, 8 o'clock, which is, you know, I'd say it's average for, you know, most people's working day and um, get to put my wee boy to bed and have a wrestle with him. And, yeah, the weekends just spent family time, really. So I think the idea of working 12 to 14 hours, I think that is, you know, people talk about working hard and I think that is always needed in the beginning because you do yeah. need to wear a lot of hats need to be going knocking on doors, doing business, as you were saying, getting business during the day, mm -hmm. and then turning the work out at night time. But there's something really special about, you know, going home and having a play with your kid yeah. and putting them to bed. Because there's something incredibly unconditional and healing about a child's love. Yeah. That just when you walk in the door and they run up and they give you a hug and it's like, whatever it was I was bothered about, yeah. or I was upset about, it was stressed me about, it's just... Yeah. It's just been vanquished in a moment. Yeah, exactly. No, I've never wanted to be that guy that looks back in 20 years and you've got 20 million pounds and you say, I never spent any time with my family and I regret it. So, um, yeah, I've always planned to have family time with Finlay and Pam and, you know, look after that because, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's much more important. And, you know, kids, kids don't want things. They actually just want your time. That's they want a the, hug. They want to hold yeah. your hand. They want you to come to sports day. Exactly. I think as well... Uh, if you are working those hours, they've got to be quality hours. Yeah. Because in my youth, I was guilty of just, you know, working like, you know, crazy hours. And what ended up happening is the Saturday and Sunday, which you do have off, it's mm -hmm. just all you can do is lie in your bed and try and put your head back together. Yeah. 
We talked earlier on about you speaking with the industry and mm -hmm. developing this pipeline. Is that something you've been doing for a while? Is that something that you thought this needs to be done? What was the, what was the starting point for that? Yeah, no, I think I've just, um, since, you know, when I was mentioning earlier on about growing a business, you need to tell people what you're doing and, you know, get that message out there. So I've been just very active since day one almost of Made Brave and I quite enjoy it. It almost feels like for therapy. <laughs> um, I quite enjoy teaching as well. So I think, you know, teaching the younger, you know, obviously, you know, they're, they're so um, sort of, they get a real buzz off of what you, you say, you know, and I think it's, it's great to be able to give that to someone. So, um, yeah, no, it's, it's something I'm, I'm, I keep meaning to look back and see how many talks I've done because I've got them all in my diary and count, but, you know, I reckon I must do a couple of hundred a year, so. <laughs> but it's great to share that message and I think it, it just ups the bar for everyone. Yeah, exactly. And I think also as well it reveals behind the curtain. I've started learning some new software and I was absolutely dreading it. Mm -hmm. But I'd said to my friend that it would do something for him. I was dreading it, was dreading it, was dreading it. And then I went through the stage of wanting to, like, you know, put my fist through my monitor. Yeah. And, you know, moving forward, uh, you know, four weeks from now, I'm just like, yeah, if you ask me to do it, I can do it with my shirt. And I think mm -hmm. at that point, it just becomes better when you have that knowledge. Yeah, and I think it's important to let people know the cool stuff that's happening in Scotland. You know, there's loads of amazing businesses and... People don't know they're here and they're, they exist. You know, there's companies like Access Animation up at Charing Cross who they've got like 150, 200 um, 3D artists and developers, and they're, they're they're making animations for Call of Duty and like some of the biggest titles in the world. And no one knows it's here in Glasgow. And I live in Charing Cross and I've never heard of them. Yeah, this is so, this is great. Yeah, there's there's I mean there's so many of these types of businesses that um, I think you know in in Scotland you know. We, we need to get better about shouting about what we're doing here because there's, there's a real great text and creative scene. Again, I think if kids are at school and they realise that that kind of thing is in Charing Cross or if it's in Dundee yeah. or, you know, wherever it is, mm -hmm. then people go, oh, I can go and do that. Yeah, exactly. If they don't know it's there, they're never going to think about it for a career path. So it's important as an industry that we're going back and telling those messages so that, you know, because it can just take that one thing for a kid to give them focus of, right, OK, I didn't realise you could you know, do that. I mean, we've got people in here that manage social media. Kids, often kids don't realise that that's paid work. That yeah. To, to learn Facebook, Twitter, and how these tools work, you can be paid, so... Yeah, it's like, you know, as an adult, you know, whether in your 30s, your 40s, your 50s, unless you work in it, it's like Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, whatever it is, it's mm -hmm. just like, you know, this thing, oh, what is this, what is this? But if you ask a 13-year-old kid, they can pretty much give you the lowdown yeah, very, exactly. very quickly, very concisely. So, with the exclusion of the awards, at what point did you think that we've arrived, we're here? Was there a moment that you bagged an account or you gave a talk that you thought... I think you never think you're here. You, kinda, you almost feel like, I, you know, kind of, I, I still don't think of myself as successful. You know, you kind of think that you always just feel like it can be pulled away at any time. So, I think if you, if you get complacent like that, then it's maybe not a good place to be. So, I'm kind of... I'm, I still don't think that we've, 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 we've got anywhere yet, so I'm still moving towards getting somewhere. <laughs> it's almost like that development of a martial artist. You never become yeah. great, you just become better than you were yesterday. Exactly, yeah. And you yeah, just improve. Yeah, it, totally. You know, I'm, as, as, as you're aware, kind of, um, you know, I do Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and, you know, doing that martial art and MMA and these kind of things, you just, yeah, you, you, you never know at all. And I think that's the same with business is that, you know, I'm very aware that I do not know at all and you know I'm a very small business compared to a lot of businesses in the world and you know I was down in London the last couple of days and when you talk to some people I feel like a child you know I feel like you know I've got so much learning to do so I think yeah I, I don't think I'll ever probably feel that I've arrived and um, yeah and I'm not sure if many people do so Was it a talk that was given by Jim McCall? Yeah and he was talking about business and he's like you know there's, there's still a lot of stuff that I don't know uh, and there's still a lot of things that I need to learn. And mm -hmm. you're just thinking, you know, you know, Jim McCall's one of Scotland's richest men, possibly one of yeah. Scotland's most successful men. And I think when he has that humility yeah. about business and that humility about learning, again, I think that's encouraging for people. Yeah, exactly. Because I think if you're, you know, starting off, you're at the, I'm not going to say the bottom, but if you're at the beginning of your journey yeah. and you're maybe trying to reach somewhere, you might go, oh, I don't know anything. Then you just go, well, these guys don't know everything. Yeah, exactly. So it's, it's a great leveller. Yeah, and I think I think the important thing for anyone thinking about starting their business is don't be scared to ask questions. Like, you know, if, if I'm in a room and someone says something I don't know, 
what they mean. I just ask them because, you know, if you know, at some point they didn't know what that meant, and you know, if you if you just sit pretending the whole time, you're never going to learn anything. So you know, continuously ask and continuously ask for help. You know, this, I've been amazed always that the Scottish business community, if you ask for help and you you put out a problem that you have, it's amazing how much people are willing to help and um, willing to share that knowledge. And so you, you've just got to keep doing it, but it's also important that you pass that back as well and um, you know pass it down. So when you see other people struggling, that you know you help them along the journey. And I think if you do that, the kind of cycle will continue. How important have partnerships in business been to you? I know that you do a lot of work with TEDx, mm -hmm. Google Digital Garage, yep. Scottish Edge. How's that affected you? Hugely, yeah. I think it's important. You know, it's much like as a human being in a social environment. You know, who you surround yourself says things about you, and um, and things about your friends rub off on you. So, I think for me, it's it's been always been important for Made Brave from growing this brand to align with other brands that that I value or that are doing things that um, that I would hope to either rub off on me or, you know, um, perception-wise that, you know, we're seen in the same pool as these kind of brands. So, yeah, no, I think it's, you, you know, if you, if you try and go for everything solely, that um, that can be a, a harder challenge than kind of finding a group of friends and, you know, helping. I think when you go to Google Digital Garage and yeah. certain events that you've put on, Scottish Edge, which I've, I've been along to in TEDx, when you go along to Digital Garage, you just realise that you're surrounded by like-minded people yeah. that all have a thirst for knowledge, that all want to develop themselves, that all want to move forward. Mm -hmm. They're interested in the stuff that you are. When you go to Scottish Edge and you hear the presentations and you're, yeah. you know, I mean, it's phenomenal. I mean, I've, I've been along to a number of them and I'm just, you know, not only are you giving a really great presentation to an audience of maybe 400, but mm -hmm. Tom Hunter's sitting across from you which is, you know, pretty scary, even if you're just having a drink with them. Yeah. And, of course, when you go to TEDx, that everyone is there wants to, you know, improve themselves, yeah. improve the community and um, improve the world. And yeah. I think that's an infectious thing yeah. in business. Yeah, I think I, I, I agree. I think, uh, you know, part of me partnering with, you know, TEDx and Google and um, is, is to surround ourselves with like-minded people that I can learn from, my team can learn from, and... Um, yeah, we can just help each other grow, and you know, and I think there's just a bigger force in groups, you know, within a community. And I think that that's the great thing about the Scottish entrepreneurial community is that it's very close knit like that. So people are willing to have partnerships and you know, cross promote each other. Um, so for anyone starting a business, it, it, um, it's, it's, it's a very good place to be starting a business. Essentially, what has been your proudest moment in business? Proudest moment. That's a good question, and I don't have an answer for it. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> um, my proudest moment. Um, yeah, I think I think I think sometimes you just kind of, um, you know, when you see you see a press article or someone says something nice about you, or you know, um, you know, you often, I often get a lot of people when I come off stage, or you know, that come up and congratulate. And I think you, sometimes you're running so fast that you forget that you know you and the team or me and the team are kind of inspiring and changing other people's lives and I think for me probably that's 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 the nicest feeling is like having positive impact on other people um, I mean our why it made brave is um, to inspire creativity in everyone and it doesn't mean you need to go and draw a picture but it just means we like to you know by giving away knowledge and giving away learning to inspire change and inspire people to be better at what they do so I think yeah when when we see the effects of that, that's probably what gives us the, the kind of buzz, you know? I yeah. Think. And again, not wanting to, to tell you stuff that you, you don't already know, but whenever I've left a Made Brave event, you know, you don't see people leaving the building with their faces tripping going, and we up the road to listen to some Morrissey. Generally, people are having incredibly animated conversations, sure, sure. and there's lots of eye contact, and they're talking about ideas, and they're talking about changing things. So I think you've got to give yourself a big win for that, a big pat on the back. No, so. Business is not obviously all ups. There's a few downs as yeah. well. What would you say that your biggest mistake is, or the biggest mistake that you've made, and what did you learn from it? Yeah, I think, I think I'm constantly making mistakes. I think you're not doing business properly if you're not you know you have to keep trying things and um, I think f for me often maybe taking on too much at one time you know um, I, I often find it difficult to focus um, I need people around me that are good at organizing and writing um, lists and planning things but you know um, yeah I, 
I don't like to dwell on on kind of um, things that we've not done right. I think, you know, I, I tend to, if I've not done something well or, you know, we just kind of get past it and just kind of move forward and try something else as well, you know. Um, I mean, there's the whole cliche of fail fast and fail yeah. quick, but I, I think there's, there's something true in it, you know. I, although, on the other hand, is like, I don't like to encourage people to plan to fail <laughs> either. Yeah. You know, I don't think you should set out thinking, oh, I'm just going to fail if it does. If I do, it doesn't matter. You know, I think you've got to set, get out and um, focus on succeeding. But, you know, if, if things don't go right, you know, there's no point in crying about it. you just got to keep moving. You know? You've got to move forward. But I think whether it be if, you know, you bake a cake or you take a photograph or a piece of film, yeah. when you look backwards on it, there's always change that you can make. But, of course, that's, the, you know, the reality is you do the best job you can at the time and then, yeah. you know, you move forward. I think that's the great thing about experience. Yeah. When you think back to the biggest challenges that you've had mm -hmm. or the toughest moments, how have you got through those? Um, I, can, I, I suppose, like, growing a business without investment and, you know, um, is probably quite a challenge, you know, um, in today's climate, you know. Um, I mean, I started Made Brave in the middle of a recession where usually the first budgets to be cut are marketing and design spend, etc. So, um I think, you know, probably one of the biggest challenges to grow to this scale and, and you know, to how to have, you know, thirty mouths to feed is quite a it's quite a quite a challenge. So, um but I think, you know, going back to our point earlier, it's you know, it's planning and not being afraid to you know, plan systems in your business, especially if you're creative, not being you know, profit's not a dirty word and, you know, um management of time in a digital and creative environment is really really important so um but I, th I think for me you know I, I think when you when you're running a business you often feel like oh god I need to be good at everything but it's really important to know what you're not good at and so when I when I interview anyone for Made Brave I ask them to tell me what they're great at and I, t I ask them tell me what you're rubbish at because you need to know your weaknesses so that you know how to surround yourself with um the right types of people so for me you know you know Stephen here that works with me as my operations director he's kind of brilliant at loads of things that I'm not and vice versa but we complement each other really well so I think you know being able to be aware that you don't have to be everything and, and you can be honest to people and tell them mm -hmm. that, you know I'm good at this not good at that um, I think the sooner you can get your head around that it's, it's, it's quite a good place to be um, and then very importantly I think for this kind of business taking yourself out of Perhaps the creative process, if you're leading a creative business, is, is probably quite a good thing. Because, yeah. you know, if I was trying to come up with creative concepts just now, you know, today, it, it, it's very difficult to do that for a client while you're running a business because you, you're not doing them justice and you're not doing the business justice. So you have to kind of pick one or the other, I think. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm, I'm certainly not going to put myself in the same creative category as you. But, you know, if I've got to do a spreadsheet and it's zeros and ones and it's Excels, yeah. It's almost like I need to sort of, you know, get a big stick in my head and lever my brain to get into that. Yeah. And once I'm in that, it's almost like keeping a lid in a pot yeah. to keep in that. But then if you said to me, oh, can you just go and write some copy mm -hmm. for 10 minutes? I'd be like, oh, yeah, that'll be easy. Uh -huh. Five minutes in, but then it's going to take another hour to get back into Excel. Yeah, they're two so, very different sides. Of oh, yeah, ones, yeah. Then, so. so I now just decide to split my time in between... Today's the day for writing copy. Today's the day for doing the research. Yeah. And then, you know, that other day, that horrible day is the day for the stuff that I don't want to do. So I think that's a, that took me quite a lot of time to learn. I used to try and, like, you know, just willy-nilly split my tasks in between everything. But I think you're right, being systematic or yeah. having somebody that complements. Yeah, exactly. And I've got, you know, I've got a very good uh, PA and office manager, Hannah, that just helps me organise because I know I'm not, I'm not great at it. Does know? she hold your feet to the fire? She, she 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 chasing me around the office trying to feed me food all day and uh, but no I mean it's it's you know I think as well for you know when you're running a business having that support you know because when I'm in here she's doing emails she's helping plan and schedule and organise diaries and without without that kind of support you know my job would be a hell of a lot harder so um, but then you know I'm good at ideas and I'm good at seeing opportunities, so I need to make sure that I've got the headspace to be able to do that stuff. So there's no point in me bogging myself down and planning and organising when I'm not naturally good at it. Uh -huh. um, and I think 
very much when you're in a kind of creative industries, you, you kind of almost see the very different character traits of different people. So, you know, um, I'm, I'm a terrible speller. Grammar is not good, but I'm very visual and, you know, that works. And I found a lot with designers, actually, they, they often not so much, you know, great with words. They're very good visually. And, uh-huh. You know, and so, so, yeah, no, so it's always interesting to, and, and don't be afraid of, like, what you're good and what you're bad at, you know. Okay, so final question. A brand is what people think about you when you're not in the room. Mm-hmm. What do you think people say about you when you leave the room? <laughs> I, don't want, I, don't want, I don't want to know what people say about me. Because <laughs> um, that's a, a good question, you know. Um, yeah, I can usually tell you that about other people's brands, but I think it's, it's always hard to know about your own. But I, I would like to think that, you know, the, the, the made bravest thought of is inspirational, that... Um, the, the you know the just the thought of energy and passion and kind of um, positivity are the kind of things that people describe us as. Um, you know, we, we try to attract people that that, that 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 want to be here, that enjoy what they do and and are passionate about it. And yeah, I would hope I would hope it's all nice things that they say about Made Brave. But who knows? Who knows? Okay, is there any question that you would have liked me to have asked you which I've not? No, I think you're very thorough in your <laughs> interrogation. Oh. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to say a big thank you to Andrew for uh, giving me an hour of his time. Obviously, anyone that's successful doesn't have a lot of time in their day, so it's greatly appreciated. And if you've enjoyed listening to this episode, please like, share, subscribe. Uh, and of course, have a great day, whatever you're up to, and stay creative. Thanks. It's the Stephen Rowan Show. Steven Rose, 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 Ste